Well, good morning. I'm glad that everybody was able to swim here this morning uh, to be here. It is a rainy, rainy day uh, outside, but um, we're glad that you're here. Hope you enjoyed the nice weather that came before that. We want to uh, extend a special welcome to anybody that may be visiting with us today. If you are visiting, uh, if you would, please fill out a visitor's card so we can have a record of your attendance. You can just hand that to somebody on your way out the door, and uh, we would very much appreciate that. Members, of course, uh, remember those special request cards if you have one of those. Open your Bibles to the third psalm, if you would, Psalm 3. We uh, made a commitment this year, of course, to um, preach through the Bible and as we do our daily Bible readings. But one other thing that I really wanted to make a special effort to do this year was to preach at least one uh, Sunday from the Psalms. And we, in January, we studied Psalm 1, and today we're in the, the third Psalm. And I want you to, for just a minute to sort of um, kind of put yourself where David is uh, when he writes the third psalm. So here's what I want you to do, and, 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 I'll, and I'll be honest, for this to work, you're going to have to really do this and, and place yourself here for a second. I want you to think about the lowest moment of your entire life. I want you to think about when you absolutely felt the worst that you've ever felt in your whole life. When you were miserable, when you were in the middle of, of tragedy, just absolutely at the worst point you've ever felt. And I, I know that's painful, but, but there's going to be a reason. Because when we get to the third psalm, David, the greatest king that's ever lived, is at the lowest point in his whole life. And he stops to write a psalm. And, and I think that's interesting. But before we get into the text of the psalm, I want us to see how David, and, and, I'm, and I said this just a minute ago, the greatest king that ever lived, we need to see how he got here. How did David, who is God's anointed, the, the great little shepherd boy who, who went and, and, and he took his rocks and his slingshot and he killed the greatest warrior ever, how did David, God's anointed king, a man after God's own heart. How did he get to this point where he writes what he writes in Psalm 3? And uh, we can start, I guess, following the death of Ishbosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 4. You'll remember Saul was king, and when he died, one of his sons was appointed king in Israel while David was appointed the king of Judah. And it's not till 2 Samuel chapter 5 that David becomes king of a newly united Judah and Israel. It's the nation there finally together. And so from that until we get to about 2 Samuel chapter 11, David is ruling in, um, in harmony. Things are going well, right? This is what God had planned all along for David's life. But then we get to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and a very famous event happens, doesn't it? David is caught in the act of adultery with Bathsheba. He sees her bathing on the roof. He gives into that temptation. He commits adultery. And to further complicate that, then he kills her husband, Uriah, who's home from battle, to hide the fact that he's gotten her pregnant. So it, we see this little shepherd boy who's, who's killed Goliath, who's God's anointed king, who's a man after God's own heart, and then before we know it, he's an adulterer and he's a, a murderer. In chapter 12, David repents, a very famous conversation he has where he's told David, you are the man that committed these sins. But in chapter 13, a whole different kind of tragedy happens. David had many wives, of course, and um, one of his wives his, uh, gave birth to his first son named Amnon. And one of his other wives gave birth to a beautiful daughter named Tamar, and Amnon began to lust after Tamar. And so the plan was conceived, and Tamar came in to check on a supposedly sick Amnon, and he raped his half-sister. So David's committed adultery, he's committed murder. Now in his own household, this assault has taken place. And all we read about David's reaction is he was very angry about these things. We don't read about him disciplining his son or, or doing anything, we just read that he was angry. 
And after two years, another son, the third son, Absalom, who we're going to talk about in great detail this morning, Absalom concocts a plan to murder Amnon. Because since he raped Absalom's sister, he concocts this plan. He invites Amnon over to his house and he kills him. I know all this sort of sounds like, and I don't mean to take it lightly, it all sort of sounds like something you see on Jerry Springer or Maury Povich or one of those type of shows, doesn't it? That there's, there's an incest going on and there's murder and killing going on. There's inappropriate sexual relationships and it sounds like all that's going on. But here's what's amazing. This is happening in the household of God's anointed king. But what's the king done about it? So after Absalom murders Amnon, he's sent away for several years. And we read that in 2 Samuel 13, 39, David's spirit longed to go out to Absalom. So in chapter 14, he allows Absalom to come back. But if you want to follow along in 2 Samuel chapter 14, we're going to start reading in verse 25. 2 Samuel 14, 25. It says, now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. When he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year, he used to cut it. When it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. He named his daughter after his sister. And then in verse 33, finally David consents to let Absalom come to him. He hasn't seen him in years, but finally he says you can come. But listen to this. Verse 33, so he came to the king and he bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king and the king kissed Absalom. So this should be the happily ever after moment. We've seen the, the negativity, we've seen the hardship, we've seen the difficulty, we've seen the inappropriate relationships, we've seen all this negative happen. We've seen a, a, a son separated from his father because of his crimes, but finally David allows Absalom to come back. He comes, he bows down before his father and he kisses him. And this should be the great moment of reconciliation. This should be the happily ever after. But it's not. As Absalom is there, he begins to go every day to the gate of the city and talk behind his father's back. He begins to gain the confidence of the people, and in over four years, he plans a coup behind the back of his father. And eventually, the conspiracy is complete, and Absalom comes in and, and takes over the capital, and David and all his household have to flee. And you want to talk about something adding insult to injury at the advice of, of one of his supposed wise men. Absalom takes David's concubines and he has a sexual relationship with them in public in the capital for everybody to see. He publicly humiliates his father in front of everybody. So Absalom, it looked just a couple chapters ago like everything was going to be great. And now Absalom has taken his father, just banished him from the capital, tried to usurp his throne and taken his concubines and, and just absolutely embarrassed his father. So to recap, David has committed adultery and murder and he lost that child as a consequence. His daughter has been raped. His oldest son murdered and now his third son has kicked him out of his own house. Man, I ask you to think about your lowest point. This is the lowest point in David's life. And it's here in the midst of all this struggle, probably sitting by the banks of the Jordan River, that David pens Psalm 3. Listen to what he says. He says, O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. 
my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. That's such a victorious psalm from David, but, but you, you try to contrast that with what he's feeling. This is from 2 Samuel 15, 30. This is the same time that he's writing this. David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered, and all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. David's walking around downtrodden with his head covered, barefoot, yet he writes this, that he still has this strong faith in God. And, and the most famous um, phrase from this psalm, and I've called the lesson, a shield about me. And this from the ESV, Lord, you are a shield about me or, or a shield around me. That's what I've called our, our lesson this morning. And, and I hope that you'll think with me for just a minute about what a shield is. The, uh, about 10 years ago, um, this sort of um, Greek culture from antiquity got really famous. There were a couple of big hit movies. One was called Troy. I, I don't know if you guys saw that movie. It had Brad Pitt in it and he was a, a warrior and all, all that good stuff. It was um, from the from the ancient epic uh, that was written about that era. And then there was another movie um, about King Leonidas called 300, about the Spartans, very famous set of, of warriors. But something that was very prolific if you watched either one of those movies was the shield. Um, they fought in battle with the shield. As a matter of fact, in ancient Greek culture, it wasn't just your shield that protected you. It was the shield of the person next to you. So if you ever saw this group come together in a formation, they would sort of put the shield out. And one side of the shield would, would cover the, the fighter or the warrior. And the person standing next to them, their shield would cover the other half of the body. They would sort of form this circle and it was impenetrable. And I think that's the way we need to think about this. If, if God is going to be our shield, I want us to think about God as... as as being impenetrable, as protecting us, as keeping us safe, even in these very difficult moments. And, and look, this morning as, as we're sitting here, I asked you to think about the lowest moment of your life. It may be that today, this very day, is your lowest moment. It may be that there's something going on in your life, some sort of struggle that, that we're aware of or not aware of. It may be that that's today your lowest point in your life. And if it is, that's okay. Because God's going to continue to be a shield covering you. And, and if, if you've been to your lowest point and now you're not there, you're going to be a testament to what we're going to talk about this morning, that God continued to be a shield around you and allowed you to recover from whatever you were going through. But, but I want us to understand this at the very outset of this discussion. And, and I wish there was some way to sugarcoat this. At some point in your life, whether you've already been through something or you never have. Maybe your life's just been a bed of roses. At some point in your existence on this earth, each one of us is going to have a moment like David. We're going to have something that just takes us to our knees financially, and, and we're going to struggle and worry about it every day. We're going to lose that job that we never thought we would lose that just makes us figure out where we're going to turn. There's going to be that, that child that comes and gives you some revelation that you were never prepared for about their life and some bad decision they've made that's going to rock you to your core. There's going to be that, that spouse that, that comes and tells you, I'm sorry, there's this secret that I've been keeping from you that just changes your life forever. That parent that you thought that would live forever will eventually pass on from this world. If we continue to live, we'll walk into a doctor's office one day and that doctor will look at us and say, I'm sorry, you have an illness that's either going to change your life or take it. Those things in life are unavoidable. They're part of it. And so what you and I have to do is figure out when life's crushing moments come our way, how do we allow God to be a shield about us, to, to cover us and, and to care for us? And so that's what we're going to talk about in the time that we have remaining this morning is, is God being a shield about us. I, I think that there's a few things we need to think about. The first one is that God wants to be our shield from hopelessness. 
our shield from hopelessness. I was looking up this week the effects on stress on, on the body. What does stress do to us? And, and I just want to share a few things, a few different ways that stress affects our body. Number one, stress affects the nervous system. It instructs our bodies to release stress hormones, including adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. That's the fight or flight response that we think about. It affects the respiratory system. We tend to breathe harder and more quickly in an effort to distribute oxygen-rich blood around our body. Stress wreaks havoc on our immune system. Cortisol release in our body actually suppresses the immune system and inflammatory pathways, and we become more susceptible to infections and chronic inflammatory conditions. The, the um, musculoskeletal system is also affected. Our muscles tense up, and we can't protect ourselves from injury and pain anymore. Cardiovascular effects, when acute stress takes our life, our blood pressure is raised, and it can damage um, different organs over time, can cause heart attack or stroke. The endocrine system also suffers in moments of serious stress. Our metabolism is affected. Tissue function, growth, and development all are um, all affected. We have gastrointestinal effects, heartburn, acid reflux. The reproductive system can be affected, especially in men. Chronic stress uh, affects the production of testosterone. Sometimes stress just works on our mind. I don't know if you've ever heard of hyperarousal. It's when we just literally cannot sleep at night because of continued stress. The way we cope with our stress can also affect us. Under pressure, people adopt habits like smoking, drinking too much alcohol, or taking drugs to release stress. Man, it's a lot of negative things that can happen to the body just because of stress. Because of this feeling of, of hopelessness. And here's what really frightens me about this. I know that every single day, there are people... And some of those people are in this room who wake up every day feeling hopeless. Feeling overwhelmed. Feeling like they can't face the day. Struggling. Feeling like they're living in a, in a pit or a black hole somewhere. And through God, it does not have to be that way. And look, I'm not trying to stand up here and be a motivational speaker and say, all right, get up and do jumping jacks for God and everything will be better. That's not what I'm saying. I, I think that this is a very serious thing. There are other people um, that, that deal with clinical depression and they handle it in different ways and may need medication. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about in moments of acute stress in our life when we're struggling and we feel overwhelmed and we just feel like that we're in this pit and we can't claw our way out of it. I guarantee you what we're going through is probably not near as severe as what David went through here. And whatever we're going through is not nearly as bad as what somebody else may be going through. And I know that's strange to make those things relative. But, but it's about our perspective. And when that perspective becomes skewed, it becomes more and more difficult to get out of bed and do the things that we know we need to do. God wants to be our shield from hopelessness. He does not want us to live in that way. And so we have to have faith in those times. We have to take those moments of hopelessness and realize that God still cares for us, even when it doesn't feel that way. That's why when David said, how many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. There always remains salvation in God. God wants to be a shield from, from sorrow. God wants to be a shield from sorrow. Verses 3 and 4, You, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. The lifter of my head. That's a, a word picture for us, isn't it? Whenever we think about somebody that's caught up in sorrow, what's the direction of their head? It's always down. There are several other times in the Old Testament where God is referred to as the lifter of of the head that God literally takes our head that's in sorrow and lifts it up and says, look to me. God being the lifter of our head, our rescue from sorrow. 
right now, we're living in a very sorrowful time. Turn on the news. And as a matter of fact, you don't even have to turn on the news anymore. Log on to social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, whatever you use. And just watch what's going on in the world. We live in one of the most polarizing, divided times in the history of our country. And maybe the history of the world. We're arguing about anything and everything. Tragedy is striking at an alarming rate. If you go and read anything about what happened at that high school a couple of weeks ago, it came out this week that the police officers who were supposed to be protecting those children cowered outside behind concrete barriers and automobiles rather than go in and engage a person who was killing innocent children. What kind of world do we live in? How can we get up every day and and face that? The only way is realizing that God is a shield from that sorrow. Understanding in our lives that no matter what happens, whether we are slaughtered in, in, a, in, a, in a classroom or whether we die in an automobile accident, that, that no matter what happens to us, even if our very life ends, that sorrow doesn't have to control our lives because of the hope that we have through God, the creator of this universe. It's, it's about having that faith that God, no matter what's going on in the world, can wrap that shield around us and say, you don't have to live a life of sorrow. And I'm not saying that we blindly walk around being happy all the time. We need to be somber at times. We need to reflect. We need to offer solutions for the things the world is going through. We need to be in prayer. We need to be those people there filling those gaps when when comfort is needed. But there comes a time in our lives where we just have to say, I've got to stay still and feel God around me as a shield. You, O Lord, are a shield around me, the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. So God is a shield from hopelessness. He's a shield from sorrow. God is a a shield of of peace. There's a very well-known story about a king who commissioned everybody um, that was one of his servants or one of his constituents to come up with a picture of peace. So all these people from all over the kingdom submitted all these different pictures of of peace, and it came down to two of them. One of those pictures was a a beautiful lake, and the water was so clear it was like a glass mirror, and in the water you could see the mountains rising above. And up at the top was all these fluffy, white, beautiful clouds, just a picture of serenity. And the second picture that was up for the prize was uh, another picture that had mountains, but these mountains were, were rugged and, and bare. There was thunder and lightning and dark, ominous clouds above. On these mountains was a, was a very vicious waterfall leading to, to rough, choppy waters at the bottom. It, it was actually the complete opposite of what you think of when you think about peace. But in that, behind that waterfall, there was a, a crack in the rocks, and there was a big green bush. And in that bush was a mama bird sitting on top of a nest in complete peace. And that's the picture that the king chose. And this is why. I I love this explanation. The king chose the second picture because peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, no trouble, or no hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all those things and still be calm in your heart. That's why when Paul wrote to the Philippian church, he talked about a peace that passes understanding. That when God wraps his arm around around us, when that shield is about us, even in in the midst of of the most difficult, tragic moment of our lives, we we can have peace. Listen to what David said. David said, I lay down and I slept. Literally at any moment, Absalom and his army could have come and killed David. They tried to do that. David says, I laid down and I slept, and I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I won't be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. And I tell you, that's one of the most beautiful, amazing things in the world, 
is to be able to put your head on the pillow at night and go to sleep. Because all of us, I want you to listen to me now, all of us have had moments where we went to put our heads down and sleep wouldn't come. Anger came. Resentment came. Sorrow came. Tears came. Being frightened was really easy, but sleep wouldn't come. David says no matter what we're going through, with God as a shield around us, we can lay our heads down and go to sleep. What a comforting thing. God is a shield to rebuild. God is a shield to rebuild. There's something about um, there's something about the morning. And, and I'll just confess this to you. I'm not a morning person. I, I hate the mornings. Um, I'm a night owl. I like to get stuff done at night when everybody else is asleep. I, I don't like the mornings. But, the, but there's something about the morning. This, this feeling of, well, it's a new day, and I can sort of accomplish anything that I want to accomplish. And you guys know what I'm talking about, that, that feeling in the morning of, of, I've got this whole day in front of me. Uh, I've, I, I can get started. And I think that we ought to think of every day in that way. David said, I, I, I put my head on the pillow, I went to sleep, and, and I woke up, and it was a new day. In a, in a situation where no matter how bad the day before has been, we wake up every day with an opportunity to, to be new. It's an opportunity to rebuild. I got this picture up here, and, and we've seen this play out all over um, the news uh, time after time. Some tornado comes through and destroys the house, and then the rebuilding starts. But I think in our lives, especially after we go through some sort of tragedy, even though God's been a shield about us, there comes a time where we have, to, we have to rebuild. Because if we go through all this trouble, if we go through the various trials that James talks about in James chapter 1, and we don't grow from them, what's the point? We don't want to just go through painful experiences and not learn anything from them. I think there has to be a, a, an evolution of our lives. There has to be a, 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 progr- a, a progression of, of growth and, and maturity for us. Otherwise, what's the point? I think it's really important there. I think that's why David says that. Arise, O Lord, save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. He says, God, you're going to allow me to win this victory. So I think there's three things we have to rebuild after we go through some sort of difficulty. The first thing, we have to rebuild our reactions. We have to rebuild our reactions. I think that's one of the the biggest parts of our maturation process, our, our reaction. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I probably shouldn't share this with you, but I will. Last Sunday morning, um, I felt as sick as I've ever felt in my whole life. As soon as I got done preaching, I went and I got in the car and, and I drove home. Felt terrible. And there was a motorcycle, um, two motorcycles in front of me. And the one in the rear just kind of cut me off in traffic. And then shot me a bird because he cut me off in traffic. Now I'm going to tell you, several years ago, it would have been a bad reaction to that. Especially I was in a bad mood. There was a firearm next to me. Um, Things would have been really bad. I'm just kidding about that part. But not the firearm being next to me, but I wouldn't have shot the guy. Um, but, but But I tell you, in that moment, you know what I did? I laughed. I said, man, what an idiot. I, that's growth. That, that's maturity a little bit. But we have to change the way we react to things. The first time that you ever got a bad diagnosis from the doctor, can, do you remember what that was like? The doctor came in and said, you, you know, you've, you've got high blood pressure. Oh, high blood pressure. I, how can I ever live? Th- oh, I'm going to have to take medicine. And those of you that that's old hat, the doctor walks in and says, um, you know, you, you've got this. Uh, disease and you're going to have to fight it. You just say, oh, okay. Well, here we go again. Because as we grow and as we learn to deal with the things that come our way in life, we change the way that we react to things. We're not hopeless and in despair every time we hear something negative because we know that life's going to have its ups and downs. Butch talked a couple weeks ago about the mountains and valleys in life. We just better be prepared for that. We've got to learn, learn to handle it. So we've got to rebuild our reaction. Secondly, Sometimes we have to rebuild our reputation. 
I want to be careful in the way that I say this, but a lot of times the things that happen to us in life that we're so upset about are things that we brought on ourselves. David brought a lot of this stuff with Absalom on himself because there were things that were happening in his household they didn't deal with. Now, I'm not relating that to any other situation in life except for this one that we're reading about. But sometimes we do things that cost us our reputation. I have a lot of preacher friends I know that have been caught doing something they shouldn't, and it cost them their job and their career. We see celebrities doing the same thing. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, we saw it come out that there was a coach that was caught talking about paying $100,000 to a college basketball player. He was caught on a wiretap. He will spend the rest of his life trying to rebuild his reputation. But you know what? That's okay. Sometimes we have to rebuild our lives and we have to start from scratch. Sometimes we've got to rebuild our reputation. And then the third thing, and, and this is something I want us to think about. We've got to rebuild our reactions. Sometimes we have to rebuild our reputation. We have to rebuild our reality. We have to rebuild our reality. I, I want to say, to say this. There are things that are going to happen to us that forever change who we are. There are things that happen to us that fundamentally change what our life is, is going to be like. We had a guy that uh, went to church where I grew up in Columbus. And um, as long as I knew him, he only had one leg. He didn't wear a prosthetic. He just had one leg. And, and, and every Sunday, he was the happiest guy that I'd ever seen in my whole life. He was propped up against the door. He was a great doorstop, even with one leg. But he was propped up against the door and... and he was always handing out candy to this man. And I thought, man, this, this guy's great. And one day somebody told me the story about what he had, how he had lost his leg in an accident. And, and that, that really always kind of stuck with me. Another story that stuck with me, and I just reheard this story last week, is this same man, his name was Brother Azel, that he had um, gone somewhere, and, and he, he always liked to look around, and he took forever. And the guy that he was with told him the next time that I have to look for you, I'm going to leave you. And so they stopped at a gas station for the guy to fill his truck up, and there were people waiting at the pump behind him. And so he just moved his truck so that he could go and wait on Brother Azel to come out of the gas station. Well, Brother Azel thought that he was getting left, so he hopped alongside uh, for about a quarter mile on the back of that truck. And if you can just picture that, it's really funny. But, you know, in, in that moment, his reality was forever changed. Can you imagine losing a, a leg or an arm, losing a limb? how that would forever change, but, but it doesn't have to change who we are. Our tragedy does not have to define us. Let me say that. Tragedy does not have to define us. The things that happen in our life, we don't have to be, oh, that's Jeremy, this happened to him, or, or oh, that's Curtis, and this happened to him. It doesn't have to be about that. We define who we are, and who we are needs to be defined by our relationship with God. That, that's what it's about. And so sometimes, yeah, we've got to rebuild our reality. We've got to change our lives. But that's okay because our God is a shield about us. And finally this morning, God is a shield leading to victory. I'm conflicted about the end of this story. Because what happens is, Eventually, David's army kills Absalom. David is God's anointed king. God was going to have his way in his kingdom. Absalom was not going to take over the throne. Adonijah, who tries to take over the throne while David's on his deathbed, is not going to be the king. It was always going to be David, and then it was going to be Solomon. And so, Absalom in battle, because of that long hair that we read about, his hair gets caught up in the branches of an oak tree, and he's killed by 11 men. And they come to David and they say, David, God's granted you this victory. And David says in 2 Samuel 18, 33, Absalom, my son, my son, if only I had died instead of you. David gained the victory, but his life wasn't what he thought it would be. He wasn't happy about it, but, but he gained the victory. And this is why this message is so conflicting to share. Sometimes, even when you and I win, 
we don't like the outcome. I want you to think about this. How many times have you prayed for something to happen? There's somebody in your family, somebody that you love, and you've prayed for them to be healed. And then they die. We don't like that. But sometimes that is the victory in itself. Here's what I know. That, that my life is not going to play out the way that I want it to exactly. And that's okay. And this is what else I know. That if I'm a Christian, that if I wear the name of Christ, that I follow God's word, not only will I win the victory, but I've already won. I love that song that we sing sometimes. It is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There'll be no more war. It's finished. The end of the conflict. It is finished and Jesus is Lord. The battle's already been won. Our victory is already assured. All we have to do is, is stay the course. But here's what I know. There are going to be things that come up in your life and my life that are exceedingly difficult to deal with, that we don't like, that we're not prepared for. And there are going to be times where we just have to open our Bibles to the third psalm and say, God, you're, you're a shield around me. God, I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to put my head in the pillow tonight, and because of you, because of who you are, I'm going to be able to sleep, and I'm going to wake up tomorrow. And, and that's how we offer an invitation this morning. You might be here, and you might be broken and struggling, and you might think that your life is over. And I can assure you, number one, it's not. And number two, everybody in this room knows exactly how you feel. If you want to come forward and ask for, for prayers of strength or help or just some hugs around the neck, we can do that for you. But I promise you, no matter what you're going through, God can and will bring you through it. And you'll look back years from now and say, I became a better person because of this struggle that I went through. And this morning... If you're not a Christian, and when I say Christian, I mean you're a person that has repented of, of your sins and given your life completely and totally to God through his son, had your sins washed away in baptism and, and strive to live that faithful life. That's what I mean by a Christian. If you're not one, you can do that and achieve the victory this morning. The psalmist says there in Psalm 3, there is no salvation in God. We know that's not true. But there is no salvation outside of God. And so if you need that salvation this morning, this is the time we've set aside for that. Whatever your need may be, come as we stand and we sing this song together. He will bear you gently Gently to his fall See him soul and open Open I am Lord Why keep Jesus waiting Waiting at Softly, softly, or and all, hear him so and open, open I am boy. Why keep Jesus waiting? Oh. Uh -huh.